Ours is a generation where everything nailed down seems to be coming loose. Uh, things that we thought would never happen are happening. And thoughtful Christians are asking the question, what kind of a man, what kind of a woman does it take to make an impact on this generation? I gather with a group of local pastors each month to pray together, and a few weeks ago we uh, gathered in a historic location, the Mount Bethel Meeting House, the original building uh, that was built back in 1767 up the hill. And we gathered just for one simple reason. Uh, There are several documented revivals that have taken place in this area, in that building. And so myself and 19 other pastors, uh, Methodist, Presbyterian, Baptist, Christian Missionary Alliance, met all inside our old building. Uh, It was was a sweet time. We sang hymns. we, We prayed the names of God. We called down the promises of God. And we basically were pleading with God for his forgiveness on uh, for us uh, in terms of this region and and how we've turned away from his holiness and we declared that that this area was his and that what he's done in the past we invite him to do again and we recommitted ourselves that day to lead his bride in a holy pursuit of righteousness Uh, we even climbed into the balcony here where they used to uh, uh, reserve that section for the slaves and the native americans uh, back in the 18th century and we cried out to god for forgiveness for the racism of our forefathers that existed. And we spent a couple of hours here uh, in this uh, old chapel, no lunch, uh, you know, no, no frills, no electricity, uh, just a bunch of pastors on our knees crying out to God uh, for revival in this area. There was a few of us there that had all got our start here, uh, me representing Mount Bethel, and then there was a couple of Millington people, and uh, someone in the, the room, one of the pastors said, Ar- aren't, isn't this where you guys all got your, your start? Isn't this where your two churches began back in this building? And I was kind of embarrassed that I was getting called out there. I said, yeah, that's our old place. And I said, well, why don't you guys go up on stage behind this pulpit here, and we're going to gather around you and lay our hands on you that you might continue to proclaim the truth in this area. I said, okay, let's do that. So they gathered around us and we we prayed for courage and we prayed for confidence, which means with faith that we would continue to exalt Christ in this area. And it was a sweet time of prayer that God would bring down His glory again on this mountain. Uh, The word glory in the Bible means heaviness or weightiness. Kind of like if you're walking on the beach, you know that damp part right by the water uh, where you step your foot and it makes an imprint, right? The weight of my body comes down and makes an impact on the sand. Uh, Just like that, when the glory of God comes down, there's an impact that's felt. The manifest presence of Christ leaves an impression and you are never the same again. And so it's our prayer that God would would uh, come back to this area and we declare, we made a declaration right there at the pulpit that we were not ashamed of the gospel and that we would lift up Christ and he would draw all men to himself and we declared that we will, we will preach the truth. And we're going to continue to gather uh, once a month as pastors uh, to stand in the gap for our generation. We're all reading a book called The Wells of Revival uh, that documents the different revivals that have occurred in our, in our, in our section of New Jersey. And if you look at the I-78 there, it documents 13 different churches that were greatly affected, not only in the First Great Awakening, but the Second Great Awakening. And we're going we're gonna to go to one place each month and re dig those wells and ask God to remember the prayers of our forefathers and to come back to this area and shake this place for His glory. Because the answer to our problems is not in the Supreme Court, right? The answer to our problems is not going to be found in Washington. The answer to our problems is Jesus. The answer to our problems is the gospel of the Lord Jesus. And I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation. Amen? Amen. Now, if you're like me, when you share the gospel, uh, you can run into all kinds of problems. You may share the gospel with somebody who is not a Christian, and they do not seem interested in spiritual things. And the minute you step towards the subject, they step away from the subject. Or other times you try to talk about Christ, and uh, you're not more than five minutes into the conversation, and they say, well, you know, wait a minute, my neighbor's a Christian, but the only time he lives like it is two hours on Sunday morning. If that's what Christianity is, then I don't want anything to do with it. Or other times you try to talk to someone about the gospel, and it becomes very obvious that they're trying to make a fool out of you and uh, make you look like an idiot. 
So just as they're trying to make a fool out of you, you decide you're going to try to make a fool out of them. And just as they ask you questions you can't answer, you start asking them questions that they can't answer. And pretty soon you realize you haven't really had a discussion about Christ. You had a full-fledged argument that requires some apologies. And with experiences like that, it's only a matter of time till we lift up our hands out of desperation and disgust and say, how in the world are we supposed to make an impact on our culture uh, for Christ? Well, the text today addresses this very issue. And so I'd like for us to go back to the book and take a look at a story and watch how Jesus reached out to lost people himself in John chapter 4. Because he does it quite well and provides a model for us to reach out to the lost in addition to being a blessing in, in, in our lives. So here we find this model that we can follow. John chapter 4, you can turn there. It's one of my favorite passages in the whole Bible. One of my favorite episodes where Jesus has an encounter uh, with a lost person. There's so much here, so I just want to get right into it. And we'll pick it up in verse 1. If you're ready for God's word, say amen. Amen. It says, Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John. Remember we talked about that last week with John the Baptist. Although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. Now take a look up here at this map. This is where Jesus was. Jesus was going up from Judea to Galilee, and in the process of doing this, he had to go through Samaria. But you need to know at that time, the Jews didn't go through Samaria. They went around Samaria on the east side here on purpose, and the reason was because there was so much animosity between these two groups of people. Uh, The Jews viewed the Samaritans as half-breeds, as unclean. Although they were descendants of uh, of their forefather Abraham, they had also intermarried with the Gentiles, and there was some paganism there and some syncretistic religion, lots of false teaching. They came up with their own Bible called the Samaritan Pentateuch, which was corrupted, and they actually built their own temple in their region of the land of Israel on Mount Gerizim as opposed to worshiping at the temple that God had instituted in Jerusalem. And so these two groups didn't really like each other. They were at odds. Let me give you a quote from the Mishnah, which is a collection of Jewish interpretations of Scripture written around 200 A.D. Quote, He that eats the bread of the Samaritans is like he who eats the flesh of swine. Unquote. So you get the flavor, right? Let me read you another uh, quote from the wisdom of Ben Sirach. It, it captures that same attitude written in 200 B.C. There are two nations that my soul detests. The third is not a nation at all. The inhabitants of Mount Seir, which is where Esau uh, uh, was inhabiting. The second, the Philistines. And third, the stupid people living in Shechem. Who's that? The Samaritans. So needless to say, they, they didn't beat around the bush. They didn't like each other. And uh, to put it lightly, right? But what's so interesting about this story is that Jesus, a Jew, goes right through Samaria on purpose. Now, can I just make a side point here? It's important for you as a Christian to intentionally maintain social contact with unbelievers. You have to do that intentionally. You can't say, well, I just don't like those people, so I don't want to spend any time with them. That's what many Christians do. But in doing so, we've actually quarantined the gospel. We go to church, we've got Christian friends, we might do a Bible study in the middle of the week, and that's all good, but if we're not careful, we may isolate ourselves from unbelievers altogether. What's interesting nowadays is they even have Christian yellow pages. So if you have a plumbing problem, you can uh, you know, you know, talk to a Christian about your plumbing problems or electrical problems. Heaven forbid you'd ever have to talk to an unbeliever about your plumbing problems. Now, I know Christian fellowship is important, but some of us who come from church backgrounds were, were encouraged to keep a safe distance away from non-Christians uh, altogether. But let me just point out that Jesus right here did the exact opposite. He was known as a friend of tax collectors and sinners. It was a scandalous thing in his day, and we need to follow his example. My point is, what's wrong about all that if you, is if you're not careful, you can cut yourself off from lost people altogether. Because, I mean, that's not good. That will be like a football team who spends all their time in the huddle. I mean, you're, you're just not going to gain much yardage that way, right? Get back in the game. For some of you, this not, will, will not be hard at all. You work or you go to school with unbelievers. You can check this off your list, but no, no problem. But for others of you, you have restructured your life in such a way that you don't encounter those outside the faith ever in any significant way to influence them. So if that's you, you're going to have to think creatively about how you can contact unbelievers socially in your life like Jesus did. If you're with me, say amen. Amen. Let's go back to the text. Verse 5 says this. So he, being Jesus, came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. That's 2,000 years earlier. 
Jacob's well was there. By the way, Jacob's well is still there. It's been there for 4,000 years, still has water in it. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Now for the sixth hour, that's high noon for them. The day started at 6 a.m. This is the absolute heat of the day. Nobody would ever come draw water during the heat of the day unless, of course, you were trying to avoid people, which is exactly what she was trying to do. Most people would draw water in the morning, in the cool of the day. But this woman was an outcast. She was an outsider. Even among her own people. Here she thought she'd be alone, but she's about to have an encounter with Jesus of Nazareth who strikes up a conversation. And it goes like this. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Now, just asking for a drink may not sound like a big deal to you and me, but if you were in this culture, I guarantee you wouldn't have missed the significance of this. And I guarantee you, she didn't. Because in that culture, it would be very odd for a male to talk to a female, first of all, but it would be strange as can be for a Jewish man to, to strike up a conversation with a Samaritan woman. So she's shocked. Jesus is reaching across almost every cultural barrier that they had set up. The racial barrier, the, the gender barrier, uh, even the moral barrier, we'll see, is, is something that, that just basically said Jesus shouldn't have anything to do with this woman, but Jesus doesn't care. You see how radical this is? She's stunned by this. She's so amazed. She, 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 you shouldn't be speaking to me. How can you, of all people, be asking me, of all people, for a drink? Man, this is getting good, right? I love this story. Listen to Jesus' reply. Verse 10. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that's saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked Him, and He would have given you living water. Wow. The woman said to Him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. You don't even have a bucket. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his uh, livestock. Jesus answers her like this. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Wow. Now, first of all, you need to know that Jesus is no longer talking about physical thirst. Rather than talking about the thirst of the body, he's now talking about the thirst of the soul. He's using thirst as a metaphor. A metaphor for a longing that she has deep down inside that's far more significant than physical thirst. And he's saying to her and to all of us, all of us are irremediably thirsty. All of us are irremediably thirsty. We as human beings are all very thirsty. But the problem is, like Mick Jagger said, we can't get no satisfaction. Not on this planet, we can't. Let me just give you some examples in your outline of thirsts that our culture uh, exhibits. Longings that we all have. Just jot these down. For example, we all thirst for purpose. We all thirst for purpose. We want to know, why am I alive? Why, was I, why, why am I here? We all want to know deep down that we're not an accident. But the problem is, if you cut God out of the picture, you have to admit, you are an accident. You have to admit that without God in your worldview, there's no reason that you're alive. It's silly to think that you could ever have a purpose. You have to admit that all of history is, like Shakespeare said, a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. But if there really is no greater purpose, well, then that leaves us very thirsty. So when you talk to unbelievers, this is the kind of way that you arouse interest. You begin to draw their attention towards the universal spiritual longings that we all have. We all thirst for purpose. Secondly, we all thirst for significance. Significance. We all want to feel like our life counts for something. You ever see the original movie Rocky? Okay, one person. Just a few. All right, most of us. <laughs> One of my favorite movies, you know, you got this underdog, no-name fighter, and he's going up against the heavyweight champ, Apollo Creed. Do you remember that scene in the movie right before he fights Apollo, and he's talking with his wife, Adrian? I don't know if you remember what he said, but it's very profound. He says this, quote, 
All I want to do is go the distance. Nobody's ever gone the distance with Creed. And if I can go that distance, you see, and that bell rings, and I'm still standing, I'm going to know for the first time in my life that I wasn't just another bum from the neighborhood. Unquote. What's he saying? I want to know that my life counted for something. I want to know that I had some sort of significance, that I mattered. It's a longing that we all have. We all long for significance. Third, another example, we all thirst for belonging, for belonging. We all want to feel like we are part of something bigger than ourselves, part of a group. You remember that sitcom, Cheers, in the 80s? Why was it so famous? Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name, where they're always glad you came. Sometimes you want to feel that you can go somewhere and your troubles are all the same. Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. You want to feel like you belong somewhere. We're thirsty for that, to be part of a group. And then lastly, number four, perhaps the biggest one, we're all thirsty for love. I believe this is the deepest longing. We're thirsty for love. One time I saw an interview with Madonna, and she was asked, what would you title your whole life if it was made into a novel? And she said, title it this, Madonna, A Lonely Life. And the interviewer asked her, well, how come Madonna, with all of your fame, how could you be so lonely? And she said this, quote, I want everyone in the world not just to know me, but to love me. To love me. Now, isn't it interesting that she didn't find that her thirst was quenched in all of her music career and that money and the fame? Why? Because deep down, she was still crying out for what we all need most, love. Now, if you're honest with yourself, I think deep in our hearts, we can all relate to one of these thirsts or perhaps all of them. These are our longings as human beings. We're all thirsty for these things. But the problem is, what Jesus is saying here, look at verse 13. Nothing in this world will ever truly satisfy those longings that you have. If you drink from the waters of this world, you will be thirsty again. Don't you see there's nothing here that can ever actually quench your thirst? Okay, you might find something that might last for a little while, but trying to quench your thirst with the stuff in this world is like trying to quench your thirst by drinking olive oil or something. Yeah, it's liquid. I guess you can drink it, but it's not really going to quench your thirst. I read an article this week called Five Things You Think Will Make You Happy But Won't. On the list was fame, wealth, beauty, intelligence, and power. Now, if you, like me, are 0 for 5, we're out of luck. (laughs) But that doesn't even matter because the, the point of the article was that they don't even satisfy. They're all polluted, dead water sources that leave you even more thirsty than when you started. Friends, what Jesus is saying to this woman, here it is, if you put down the bucket of your soul, down any of those wells, you'll always come up thirsty again. Always. But you know what? Like a lot of unbelievers I talk to, she doesn't get it. She just, she just doesn't get it. Take a, take a look at her response in verse 15. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here uh, to draw water. Now clearly she is not tracking with him. She's not thinking about her spiritual thirst at all. And you know what I found when you talk to unbelievers? That's actually not that uncommon. Most people will not actually admit that they're thirsty. Most people will not be willing to admit that their plan to quench their thirst isn't working. They won't admit that they're not satisfied. They won't admit that they're not truly happy. They won't admit that they're actually thirsty. Tim Keller says, instead of admit we're thirsty, typically people do one of three things. Option one, we blame the things. We blame the things. What that means is, let's say you were going to a certain well to quench your thirst and you found it wasn't good enough. You say, well, that must have been the wrong thing the wrong career, or that was the wrong house, or that was the wrong spouse, or, uh, you know, this is what successful people do. They make their goals, they reach their goals, they find out they're not satisfying, so they pursue other goals. So they say, well, when I have blank, then I'll be satisfied. When I finish my doctorate degree, when I get my wife, when, I, when, I, when we have kids, or, or a bigger home, or a faster car, on and on and on, but the nature of those kind of appetites is such that they are never satisfied. It's never ending, and, and really, you look quite foolish. Second option is not just to blame the things, but some people blame yourself. You can blame yourself. The reason why I'm so thirsty is because of me. I, I never made the right choices. I, didn't, I shouldn't have trusted that person. I shouldn't have married them. I shouldn't have made that decision. I, I was foolish. So you blame yourself. And this way of thinking can really lead to depression. It's my fault. I'm the reason I'm thirsty. So you can blame, the uni- you can blame yourself. You can blame the things. But thirdly, you blame the universe. 
This is when people say, I know what the problem is. I was young and naive. Now I've grown up. I realize this world is really a cold, hard place. Life's not fair. Nobody said it was going to be fair. The universe is not fair. So you just got to keep a stiff upper lip and you become very cynical. And so you give up on those things. But the problem is when you give up on the idea of ever quenching your thirst, you give up your humanity too. And you give up what makes you a nice person to be around because you become a very bitter a person to be around. So you can blame the universe, you can blame the things, you can blame yourself, but you're really just trying to avoid the problem. And this woman is somewhere in one of those three things. She's not yet ready to admit that she's irremediably thirsty. And as a result, mid-course, Jesus makes a correction in the way that he is talking to her. He makes an adjustment and he decides to bring up something in her life that may get her thinking about her spiritual thirst. And it comes up in verse 16. Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. Now, ladies and gentlemen, he now has her undivided attention. <laughs> Listen, my friends, you can lie to others. You can even lie to yourself, but you can't lie to Jesus. Look at her response. The woman answered him, I have no husband. And I think she said that in such a way that was, I don't want to go there. Jesus answered her, You are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. And he has just put his finger on the thing that she has been using to try to satisfy her spiritual thirst, namely other men. Now can I just say something to the women in the room? Because some women can fall into this trap of thinking that they are going to have their spiritual thirst satisfied with other men. And it can cause a lot of real problems. And they go from broken relationship to broken relationship and on and on and on. And I've got to say something that's kind of awkward, it's kind of uncomfortable, but somebody's got to say it, okay, so I will. Listen, God designed sex for marriage. But ladies, if you give that up before He makes that commitment to you, You've taken away one of his main reasons to make that commitment to you in the first place. Like, why buy the cow if the milk's free? You know what I'm saying? Now, I'm not mad at you. I'm not trying to condemn anybody. I'm just trying to say, don't be naive. Don't be like everybody else in this crazy culture. Listen to 1 Corinthians 6. This is what God says. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? Amen. You are not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Amen. Now, don't get me wrong. Your desire to be married is a good thing. It's a gift from God. But at the same time, I have run into women who are a little naive about this. You say, Dave, what do you know? I know because they tell me. And I've talked to a lot of them. And I hope there's nobody in here, but, but they're out there. And they believe some of the biggest lies that men tell the guy says, well, honey, you know, I love you and I need you and I can't live without you, but, but if you just let me move in first, if we can just try this out first, and you buy that garbage and it doesn't work, or he says, oh, it's almost like we're married anyway, you know, mar we're one, marriage is just a certificate, so it doesn't really matter. Wait a minute. Yes, it does. Okay, yeah, God created sex. He created it for a context, though, in a covenant commitment. You get it outside of that context, it, does, it destroys your life. It's like fire. It works really great in a fireplace, but you take those same embers and you spread them all over your house, your house is going to burn down. And they say, oh, well, I love him, I love him, I love him. I have a question sometimes. It's, okay, what do you love about him? What do you love about him? Because if you can't answer that question, you're better off without him. Oh, well, maybe God brought me into his life to, to increase his potential. Huh? Excuse me? You're nuts! <laughs> Generation after generation after generation, women believe men's stupid lies, though. And you fall for the same thing over and over and over again. Your mama told you, your grandma ought to warned you about that, but you just don't listen. And the reason is because you're spiritually thirsty. I know I'm picking on women. I pick on men in other sermons. Go back and listen to my sermon on Judges when I talked about Samson. I was pretty darn hard on the men in that sermon. Okay, so But this year, it's in the Word of God. It's about a common struggle that women have. And so i got to address it, right? So for the single ladies in here, listen. If a guy can't afford to marry you, he can't afford you. You know why? Because you're worth more than that. That's why. Oh, Pastor Dave, you're so old-fashioned. People have been doing this kind of thing for 2,000 years. There's nothing new about cohabitation. This is not a new thing. You're, you didn't come up with this. 
Men have been mistreating women like this for years and years and years. And I can tell you right now, women get hurt. So just consider there might be some wisdom in the Bible for you. God's word is not there because he wants to keep something from you. God's word is there because he wants something for you. His, his word is there for your protection, Amen. for your own good. It's because he wants what's best for you. So let's, let's move on. Jesus puts his finger right on her issue and, and her response is interesting. The woman said to her, him, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Which I find kind of funny. I don't know why. It's like, duh. I can see that you've been reading my mail. I can see you went to my Facebook wall. I, you're a prophet. And then she has a question. Okay, so since you're this prophet guy, verse 20, our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Which is it? Now, some people believe that this is a deflection because she felt uncomfortable and convicted about her sin, and that might be the case. But her question also might be about this. Where do I go to sacrifice for my sin that you, the prophet, just pointed out in my life? You see, because when you meet a prophet who speaks the truth from God to you and gives you God's word about your sin, the next thing you need is a priest from God. Because a priest in their system, if, yeah, that's what you need to offer a sacrifice to make atonement for your sins. And so maybe, just maybe she's saying, where is the legitimate priesthood that I should go to? Maybe she's saying, I'm not going to run away from God anymore. Instead, I'm going to come back to you and I'm going to come clean. Now, when God convicts you of your sin, you have two choices. Choice number one is you can justify your sin. You can try to change the law. Oh, well, that, you know, that's not really sin. I know that law applied to the human race for thousands of years, but because we're smarter than them and we're more advanced now, we've got it all figured out. And so we know those rules no longer apply to us. Those rules are ancient and archaic and they no longer apply. Sound familiar? But let me tell you something. When God convicts you of your sin, it's because He loves you. It's because He's concerned about the road you're going down. It's because He sees a freight train coming your way. And it's because his cry out of love is that you would not get run over. So the second response, when God convicts you of your sin, is genuine repentance. Genuine repentance. It's when you agree with God about your sin and you turn back to him. You say, okay, God, I've identified this. You've identified this sin in my life. And God, I'm going to come back to you. And friends, maybe for you it's not men, but maybe it's something else. And I think all of us here, by way of application, should consider what is our water jar. And we need to name the ways that we seek to satisfy our thirst apart from God. Because all of us are in the same boat as her. We need to name those things. And to name them before God, and I would even argue to name them before a trusted friend. You say, well, my secret's safe with me. No, it isn't. Your sin grows in the dark. Joe Gannon says, you're as sick as the secrets you keep. You've got to name them with a trusted Christian friend. Name the ways that you seek to satisfy your thirst apart from God. Now, the Bible has a word for that, those ways. It's called idolatry. It's the sin behind the sin. It's the breaking of the first commandment. Calvin said, our hearts are like idol factories. Because the reality is in every instance which we sin, in that moment, what we are saying is that this thing, or this person, or this pleasure, or this possession, or this position, whatever it is, has a higher place of prominence in my heart than God does. That I need it more than I need God. That I want it more than I want God. That I, want, that I trust it more than I trust God. That's an idol. And we need to name those idols before God. So what is it for you? And what is it for me? Is it men? Is it women? Is it money, power, sex, your career, food, some other addiction? We need to name those things before God in a spirit of genuine repentance. I believe that's what she's doing. And in this story, what's amazing is that she comes to Jesus in her place of greatest shame, and he meets her there. He's not ashamed to meet her there. And he becomes not only her prophet, but he's about to tell her, listen, I'm going to be your priest as well. Listen to his answer to this question. It's amazing. He says this. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. 
We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. Wow. Now you may remember from the last couple weeks that when John uses the word hour, what he's talking about there is the hour of Jesus' death. And that's what Jesus is saying here. It's that He came to bring something entirely new in terms of worship through His death. And it's not kind of new. It's entirely new. It's not Jewish worship 2.0. It's entirely new. And He's saying everything you see here about this temple is over. It's all coming to an end. Because the time is coming when when you will never need to be uh, going to a priest who would offer sacrifices on your behalf anymore. And the reason is because he would offer himself as a sacrifice once for all and make atonement for her sins and for the sins of the whole world. Now that's amazing. Love so amazing. Love so amazing. 25 says this. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am He. Whoa. I am the Messiah the prophet spoke about. I am the Christ. I'm the one you've been waiting for. I am the prophet. I am the priest. I am the king. I am your Messiah. And you can find the answer to all your sin problems right here with me. That's why I came. I came here not only to die for you, but to offer you living water. And if you drink the water I give you, you will never thirst again. You know why? You know why? Because, friends, this is the message of Christianity. Jesus says, you and I are all irremediably thirsty. And there's only one reason. You can try to blame the things. You can try to blame yourself. You can try to blame the universe. But those are not the reason why you're thirsty. There's only one reason why you're thirsty, and it's this. You have been separated from God. That's why you're thirsty. You have been separated from God because of your sin. That's the problem. And so the question is, will you admit that that's the reason why you're so thirsty, that you've been separated from God? Won't you admit that that longing that you feel, that desire, is your desire to be back in fellowship with your Creator? You know, I love C.S. Lewis. And uh, he said something like this. If you look around in nature... You see that for every desire, there is a corresponding object to meet the desire. You know, ducklings want to get in the water and swim. There's such a thing as water. Uh, birds get hungry. There's such a thing as worms. Uh, babies crave milk. There's such a thing as mothers. But then Lewis said this. But if I find in my heart a desire for which nothing on this planet can satisfy. The only rational reason must be that I was made for another world. That I was made for a desire that's not here. That I was made to fellowship with God. Friends, that's true. You're more than flesh and blood. You're so much more than that. You're a spiritual being. And you're made to have fellowship with the living God. But unless you give God access to the well of your heart, You'll remain thirsty forever. You'll have a parched soul forever. The reason is because you're thirsty for Him. And here's the good news. This is why Jesus came. Look at the offer He gives this woman. He says, I've got water. I've got water that will quench your soul forever. It's a different word from the word for well. The word He uses is the word spring. I will give you a spring of water. I will give you a new heart. A new fountain on the inside of you which will flow from within you and eventually that spring will purify your whole life. If you will only come to me and admit you're thirsty for me. Admit you're thirsty for me. Won't you come to God and admit you're thirsty for me? I'd like to make an interesting comparison to hold that thought. We just finished John chapter 3. And John chapter 3 was about a conversation Jesus was having with Nicodemus. And now we have John chapter 4, where he has this conversation with a Samaritan woman. And the reason why they are side by side is intentional. John puts them that way for a specific reason. In other words, he wants us to compare them together and contrast them. Now I know on the surface they seem very, very different, but just consider for a moment. On the one hand, the character we met in chapter 3 
has a name, Nicodemus. But on the other hand, the character in chapter 4 has no name. She's just called the Samaritan woman. On the one hand, Nicodemus is a male. On the other hand, she's a female. On the one hand, Nicodemus is a Jew. On the other hand, this woman is from Samaria. On the one hand, Nicodemus is a highly respected ruler and the teacher in his part of the land. On the other hand, this woman's not respected by her culture at all. On the one hand, Nicodemus is an insider. But on the other hand, this woman is an outsider. She's an outcast. And so on the surface, they couldn't be any more different, right? What a contrast. But the purpose of the contrast, the reason why John puts them side by side, is for Jesus to say to all of us, this is the breath of my mercy. Who does not fit somewhere in between these two extremes? All of us are irremediably thirsty. We're all spiritually thirsty because we've all been separated from God. And we need God to quench our spiritual thirst. Won't you come to Him and admit you're thirsty? As we read earlier, as the deer longs for the water brook, so my soul thirsts after God for you, the living God. Won't you come thirsty? Amen. Friends, Jesus has made provision for your thirst. And here's the thing. It's free. You know, we buy bottled water at our home. And we have a common joke that goes, why are we buying water when you can get it for free? Now, the water we get at ShopRite is like $3.99 for like 24 bottles, which is pretty good. But I did a little research on bottled water, and I found out bird water, which comes from a glacier in western Greenland, is $99 for a 24-pack. I did the math. That's 6 bucks a bottle. Can you imagine that? But I bet that's pretty good water. But I did a little more research. And I found Veen water, which is bottled in a remote Finnish spring. It retails at $228 a case. Whoa! That's over 20 bucks a bottle. Case of 12. Let me ask you this. How much money would you pay for water from a spring in heaven? Friends, Jesus says this. How about nothing? How about free? How about if anybody's thirsty, let him come to me Amen. and drink. If you're one who thirsts, you fit the criteria. The living water is offered to you, free of charge. You don't got to pay for it. You don't got to work for it. You, don't gotta, you just have to receive it. And then your thirst for purpose and your thirst for significance and your thirst for peace and your thirst for belonging and your thirst for love will be finally satisfied in him forever. You'll never thirst again. That's what happened to her. The story goes on to say that she trusted Christ and that she left her water jar there, the thing that she was so consumed with. Her priorities completely changed and she went back and told everyone in her town that she met a man who told her everything she ever did, which must have been a long conversation, but that he was the Messiah and that she received forgiveness for all of her sins and she found someone to remove all of that shame and what he did for her he wants to do for you and for me Amen. listen Jesus knows everything about you and he wants to meet you at your place of deepest need and you may be ashamed of that thing but he's not ashamed to meet you there and what he's saying here is I know everything about you just like I knew everything about that woman but I still love you and I want to offer you something that will quench your thirst forever. A, a restored relationship with me. So powerful. So powerful. Let me close with this invitation from the book of Revelation. One of the last verses in the Bible. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let the one who hears say, Come. And let the one who is thirsty, Come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. Amen? Amen? And Heavenly Father, how grateful we are for the Lord Jesus who went out of His way to meet our needs. He came in weakness, but offered us great strength. Forgive us for turning away, for seeking to satisfy our thirst in a myriad of different ways. And help us to learn this lesson that You are the only one to bring eternal satisfaction to our souls. Remind us again that deep down we are thirsty for you. We are thirsty for you. In Jesus' name I pray.
and all God.